All right, well, this is, uh, I guess, sort of where it began. This is the DX7. And it's got to be one of these sounds. Not that one. Not that one. Ah, fretless bass. I had no love in my life at that point, and I had not gotten laid in four years. I never went in the studio, I never heard it, I never played on it, I never had anything to do with it. I think there are people that have no idea what it's talking about. So that's all you've done? Boys, boys, we are rushing! <laughs> Watch it in slow motion as you turn around say. Take My Breath Away is a gift that keeps on giving. So I went outside and uh, fixed his brakes and on his Ferrari. And uh, good thing that went well, because none of this would have happened, right? Ja, goda kunskaper om bilar, en ny synthesizer, ett obefintligt sexliv och så en massa flygplan. Det kan verka långsökt, men rör ihop allt det där, krydda med lite tidspress, så har vi en av musik- och filmhistoriens allra största ballader. Ja, alla har förmodligen hört Take My Breath Away, vare sig man vill eller inte. Men vilka är egentligen de där Berlin? Och är det ens de som spelar? Berlin, ja. Låter ju helt klart europeiskt. Nej, vi är i Los Angeles, staden som breder ut sig över så stor yta att man knappt kan säga var den slutar. Hemstad åt mellan 3 och 13 miljoner invånare beroende på hur man räknar, men helt säkert över 20 miljoner bilar. Och så Hollywood förstås. Och det är också här som en tonårig Terry Nunn med ett bultande musikhjärta gläntar på dörren till skådisvärlden. The next page. Uh, I'm on pins and needles. Ja, vi har passerat mitten av 70-talet. Terry skymtar en del på tv och provläser rent av för rollen som prinsessan Leia i kommande Star Wars-filmen. Men så en dag så kommer ett erbjudande som ställer allt på sin spets. It was a show called Dallas, which was a series at the time that was just starting. And they called me in. It was the part that Charlene Tilton did, the, the teenage part. He said, here's a, here's a contract, seven years. Do you want to do it? And I was like, oh, shit. You know, this, I'm either going to do this now for the rest of my life, or I'm going to try the music thing. So I turned it down, Dallas. My manager dropped me. The agency dropped me. They said, are you out of your fucking mind? I mean, this is, this is it, you know? You're, you don't get offers like this in a lifetime. So I had nothing. And I gave myself a year to find a band. And it took me exactly a year to meet John. This is before we redid it. This is that original demo I told you about. Hope she's okay with me showing you this. She's not wearing much. So. <laughs> I have to apologize to you. Very so sweet. She actually put in her ad she wanted. I'm looking for something different, something unique, which is really kind of rare to say, because if you say that in an ad, you're not going to get many calls, because that's almost like condemning you to not make it any money. So it, I thought that was so sweet of her to actually be bold enough to say that, that she was looking for something different. So we immediately called her, and off we went. The music was like, I've never heard anything like this, and I really wanted something different which was good and bad because when we started playing everybody's like what the fuck is it? Nej, USA är ännu inte redo åtminstone inte för Berlin, men i Europa det ligger man långt före och blickarna de riktas främst mot Tyskland. I Düsseldorf har kraftverk blivit både kult och geniförklarade, men också München är en superhet stad på musikkartan. För det är här i Musicland Studios som Hans Jörg Giorgio Moroder i jakten på den säljande hocken revolutionerar danspopmusiken på allvar. 
there are two components. One is the voice, the other one is a synthesizer, and the, com the vocoder mixes both things together. One, two, three, four, five. I could never have a computer voice. Mest framgång har han nått med sitt fynd Donna Summer som en moroderhit som den här gått och blivit The Queen of Disco. Och när han sen vinner en Oscar för musiken till filmen Midnight Express 1978 ja, då öppnas även Hollywoods dörrar och moroder han flyttar snart till Los Angeles. Ja, vill man göra det enkelt för sig? Alla som är intresserade av elektronisk popmusik i slutet av 70-talet de är influerade av Giorgio Moroder. Giorgio Moroder var den originala producer och writer of the song that influenced the bass line and the sound for Sex, I'm Up. If you listen to I Feel Love by Donna Summer, the bass line is just the same three notes reversed. I just stole it, basically. His riff goes da 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 and mine goes da 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 I did that on purpose. I'm not, everyone knows, I've never lied about it. It was basically stolen. A radio station here called K-Rock started playing sex, and it exploded. It's, we sold 25,000 copies of the album in one month. Ja, med sin vågade framtoning blir plötsligt Berlin hetaste skiten i hela LA och skriver kontrakt med självaste Geffen Records. Men när det är dags att följa upp, ja då blir det problem. Det finns en massa bra låtar men skivbolaget de hör ingen potentiell hit. Music industry people are very logical. They look at things and they go, okay, we did this, this was successful, let's find a way to do that again. They're not thinking like let's do something weird and new, they're thinking what, what made that work? Oh. Georgia Marauder baseline. Oh, we like that sound. That really works for you guys. Let's call Georgia Marauder. It made total sense. So we asked him if he would work with us, but he was so expensive at that point that we could only afford him for one song. So the record label said, well, let's give him what we think is the hit, which was No More Words. He just has these guys do the what he wants done for him. He doesn't sit there and play anything. He just sits there and tells guys what to do. He's just so, he just operates out of a place of, um, I don't know how to put it. And he would just run in, you know, he'd run in and listen and go, uh, we need more horns. I want the more horns. Take that, put it there, take that there. You need a bop up up there. And if you do that there, that'll work. And remember that old thing we had on the Debbie Harry song? Put it at the beginning, that'll work there. And do that. See you later, I gotta go to lunch. And then he'd run out. I'm not kidding. Exactly like that. And every one of the ideas was brilliant. It was like, took the song from us going, this isn't working, to everyone going, this is a hit. All in the span, I'm not kidding, 30 seconds. Ja, men Moroders hjälp tar sig självklart låten upp på listorna. Precis som det mesta som kommer ur hans studio runt den här tiden. Giorgio, han är pojken med guldbyxorna och lever Hollywoodlivet. Kör fräsiga sportbilar och vinner av bara farten en andra Oscar för den här filmhitten. something like that be in we could hook it up to the drum machine so it would be in time of the beat and he that's what he'd say when he said give me some bubbles that's what he meant <laughs> ja, i en trång charmig liten studio i Venice där hittar vi Arthur Barrow en musiker som efter några år som bassist i Frank Zappas band blir en viktig kugge i Moroder studio these most of these here are albums that i did most, mostly during the Giorgio time worked on Scarface DC Cab Irene Cara Richie Zito, the guitar player, and I were we were his band, really kind of. Richie did the guitar and the drum machine programming, and I did this the synthesizer playing and the and the bass playing. 
And I was learning about a lot about pop music. It was interesting because I just got through working with Frank Zappa, who was completely avant-garde, mm -hmm. you know, left field, and then going to Giorgio, who really his only concern was hits. He was not interested in hearing a song if it didn't have hit potential. He thought it's a waste of time. <laughs> and uh, um, so he would like walk into the room, we're working on some boys, let me hear what you have so far. You, you played, so that's all you've done? Boys, boys, we are rushing. <laughs> Ja, vi är mitt i 80-talet, i ett år som börjar tragiskt med både Challenger, Crash och reaktorhaveri i Tjernobyl. Året är 1986 och topplistorna de domineras av Modern Talking, Whitney Houston och diverse svulstiga produktioner. Ja, plastiga syntar hörs till och med i hårdrock. Och i ett av alla klipprum i Hollywood där lyser flitens lampa ihärdigt. Efter flera års möde och samt slit och filmande håller nämligen Top Gun på att sakta sakta ta form. Men förutom Harold Faltermeyers ledmotiv så saknas musiken. Hela Hollywoods låtskrivare elit bjuds in. Hundratals låtar testas men inget passar. Det är stopp. The funny thing about Top Gun was that um, it was a very complicated film story-wise. And the first time we saw it, we, we, were, we sort of panicked. It's like, we didn't know what the hell the film was. And uh, so as the film was being cut and evolved, we were trying to find places for songs. But it just wasn't very successful. Once Giorgio had flash dance and what a feeling, all of a sudden he was in demand. And all the Hollywood people says, oh, wow, the, oh, God, what a great idea, a movie with a hit song. And so then all of a sudden, every movie had to have a hit song and it come to Giorgio. And what was missing was a love theme. And also there was not the footage to support um, a love theme. This is the, a DX7. It, it might have been this one or another one that uh, did the uh, take my breath away sound, the down, 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 down. You know, I could probably even, let me see if I can dial that sound in here. Let me get my glasses, pardon me. Giorgio was given this assignment, we need songs for this movie. So he locked himself in his control room and you could kind of hear through the door, you know, the, the beginning. He's an absolutely terrible singer. So, so you'd hear this kind of off key singing and. Take my breath away. He had this funny little voice. And uh, so I bet you he came up with that that line, that one line, and then he would have a lyricist, uh, you know, write out the rest to go with it. What happened was that Giorgio then presented a demo and uh, it was instantly liked. And so it's my job to find out places for it to go. So we, we planted it in the movie in a temporary way, waiting for the final song. Och nu har de fått ihop musiken. Hollywood är för stunden nöjda, men klockan tickar och nästa steg blir det som genom hela karriären varit lite av Moroders Achilleshäl, texten. Något han alltid mest sett som ett nödvändigt ont och redan sedan Donna Summers dagar har han anlitat textförfattare. Men nu är det om möjligt mer stressigt än vanligt och uppdraget det hamnar hos någon minst sagt oväntat. Well, this was Giorgio Moroder's studio, Oasis Recording Studios, Lancashire Boulevard, North Hollywood, California. Home of Top Gun, Beverly Hills Cop, Scarface. Let us in! Now, what I heard, did he tell you that he was, was he Giorgio's mechanic? Tom was a guy who was, well, at that time, up until the time he wrote the lyrics to Take My Breath Away, he was Giorgio's mechanic. He would work on Giorgio's Ferrari and stuff. I was a servant, really. You know, I whatever anybody needed in the studio. I mean, I'd go get lunch. I'd go get electronic parts. I'd. You know, somehow he made it known to Giorgio that he wanted to write songs, and uh, because we were in such a kind of desperate situation with our schedule and our needs, it, the first guy that walked in the door got the job. So, there was Tom. Oh, uh, it wasn't can you? It was do it. It's you know, uh, Tommaso. I need a lyric. Giorgio wrote the track um, one day and then came in and made a few changes. And um, as I drove home this direction, I uh, wrote the lyric. So I popped in the cassette, started uh, 
playing the track with uh, uh, just a bit of suggested uh, melody, vocal melody, and would uh, write some lyrics as I drove up the hillside, as we are now. And uh, by the time I'd gotten home over in Hollywood, I had most of the most of the lyric done. Okay, well, uh, I just started at the very beginning, watching every emotion in my foolish lover's game on the sunless ocean. Finally, lovers know no shame. And of course, I don't remember the lyric from here on. Turn. Oh yeah, it's now we're what turning and returning to some secret place inside. We should hire a singer if we're going to do that. And actually, it wasn't easy to find who was going to sing those songs. The combination of a record company wanting to use their artist and people seeing it and it not being quite right. But I don't know that there were that many because we didn't have much time. I think finding the voice for Take My Breath Away became a bit of a competition between Martha Davies and Terry Nunn. And they both came in and sang the song. It was a pretty simple thing. I was working a lot at Giorgio's studio, Giorgio Moroder, and I got a call from him saying, would I like to do, sing this new song that he, he had? And I said, sure, send it over. And so it, they brought it over and I listened to it and I went, that's a hit. One day he said, okay, I have this song and it's going to be this big movie, it's going to be Paramount next year is going to be so huge. Tom Cruise is going to be the biggest movie, and you must listen to this song. You should do this song. There's a lot of spec stuff in the music business where you go out and you you'll just do you know maybe something will happen. So. It was just kind of one of those things, maybe something will happen. And something did happen, not to me, but, you know, it's... Obviously, when we got to Terry Nunn, it was done. I mean, that was perfection. I thought I could do it better, and to a point I did do it better, and to a point I didn't. The melody was kind of stiff, like, watching every motion in this foolish lover's game. On this endless ocean, finally lovers, no, no shame. I was like, I had nothing to lose, so I just sang it the way I wanted to, and I just kind of elongated it a little bit. Watching every motion in this foolish lover's game. I just wanted it to be more fluid, and they loved that. What he didn't love, take my breath away. You know, I was doing all this little pretty, like, little stuff. You, you, you must make it just, take my breath away, stop. Take my breath away. Ja, Moroder får tack och lov sista ordet. Men allt är ändå inte bra, för inom Berlin blåsade upp ett bråk. Alla gillar absolut inte idén om att vika ut sig för Hollywood. It was a little hard for me because I think my ego was hurt a little bit because Berlin had been struggling um, finding an identity. I mean, we had reached this point. I had no clue. You know, he didn't want to do a song. He didn't want anybody else's song. He was, you know, had that 20-year-old ego of, you know, it's got to be my song. I have to write it, and, and nobody else can be Berlin. We are Berlin. We have to do our own stuff. I don't think it was that it, I think it just hurt my feelings. It, it wasn't, again, I understood Terry doing it. Um, you know, I shouldn't say anything, because I may, I may have reacted that badly, to be honest with you. I may have been anti the song. Do you feel you did sing this song against John's will, or...? Oh, totally. I mean, he agreed to do it because the record label was behind it and they were the money. So, yeah, he agreed to do it, but absolutely it was against... Yeah, he didn't want any part of it. Was it some kind of hesitation for you as well, then, or...? 
No. Because I knew, I knew it was an ego trip in a way for him. And I knew how hard it was for him to write every album. He was the, he wrote the majority of the songs and that's not easy to do. The record company was, and my manager and others were concerned that I wasn't able to come up with a hit song to further our career. Our third album, it kind of didn't turn out as well as everyone had hoped. And I knew it, I felt it. And then all of a sudden here comes this amazing thing. At that point in time in my life, and as an egotistical musician, it was a lot easier to say, oh, that's commercial garbage than I suck, I can't do that. Ja, samtidigt som Berlin bråkar om huruvida de ens borde vara med och borda de där F-14-planen så har låten gått och blivit den där sista pusselbiten som får själva filmen att falla på plats. I can't hear you. Well, they knew that they, they wanted to have more between the two characters and they needed a song. Så so the song informed them as to what additional scenes they really needed. And I just don't want anyone to know that I've fallen for you. Yeah, so this was added later. This was not in the original version of the movie. The the previous scene was, but this is this is all new. So we found a you know we had a long enough scene finally to be able to use it and put the lyrics in because they're always talking. Yeah, this, this is the only part where the lyrics are actually used yeah, in, in the right. movie. Yes, but it gave us an opportunity to use the lyrics. I think that's why it was so necessary to reshoot it. Ja, delvis då tack vare låten så får Tom Cruise och Kelly McGillis till slut ihop det. Och när filmen går upp på bio sommaren 1986, ja då blir det bra succé. Försäljningen av pilotbrillor skjuter i höjden och ansökningarna till amerikanska flygvapnet, ja de ökar med sig sådär 500 procent. I feel the need, the need for speed. Påhäda filmen blir såklart även musiken hur stor som helst. Soundtracket säljer rekordbra och inte minst kärlekstemat spelas precis överallt. I don't know who she is. <laughs> Look at that hair. Ja, innan året är slut har Berlin toppat listorna på båda sidorna Atlanten. Och som extra fluffig grädde på moset så kan man den dessutom hem ett litet pris. Ja. Well. That would be the Academy Award for the song Take My Breath Away from the movie Top Gun. Say hi to Oscar. And the absurd thing is that he went from car mechanic to Academy Award winner in like six months. Maybe we should get, let's go pick up Terry Nunn, have her ride around and sing. So I, to this day, don't know what the truth is or what it means. Did he tell you what it means? To me, it was just that, that track. That track caused me to write that song. See? You know, changed, I think he's just messing with me. I think there are people that have no idea what it's talking about. But it's, it's images, but yet those images add up to the request to take my breath away, meaning I want to love you, you know, make me love you, whatever. No, I got a question. Is this show on like a cable where you can curse or is this on like big, like normal TV where you have to keep it? You can curse. You can curse on this, on this channel. <laughs> Would that make the, the story different? Absolutely, different? yeah. Because I can tell you what it means to me. Oh, cool. I I had no love in my life at that point and I had not gotten laid in four years. So the reason it I sound so sad singing it is because of that, because I didn't have that in my world and I sang from that place. This song you may have heard here before. It's called Take My Breath Away. So then it became this huge, you know, the biggest single we ever had. It was international number one everywhere. And then he was even madder, John, because then he had to play it every night. Watching in slow motion as it turned to me say Take my breath away. I love
loved it because it opened up the world. We were able to play in countries that didn't know us, but it was also the end of the band because John was, we just didn't agree anymore on what to do. Well, it, I think it kind of drove us apart, basically. That sort of ended it, I think. It was kind of a, I don't, yeah, I don't. In what way? I don't remember the feeling, to be honest with you, Magnus. It's kind of a funny thing. Is it hard for you speaking about this today? Not at all. No, 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 no. Was it at the time? You mean uh, the whole take my breath away thing? Yeah, it was difficult. It put a wedge between Terry and I, I think. This whole, you know, the whole thing that people talk was not as bad as some people make it out to be, but it was pretty bad. Um, it was partly caused by that. One more time. You assign one good, quiet child to go pick up your rocket for you. Okay, make the other one stay seated. Alltså här snart 30 år senare har John Crawford klivit ur rampljuset. Idag lever han familjeliv i Orange County där han driver ett företag som undervisar skolbarn om naturvetenskap. We launch rockets. It's a kids favorite thing. Och Terry Nunn då? Ja, hon släpper fortfarande skivor och turnerar med ett nytt Berlin. Givetvis med Take My Breath Away som en hörnsten på reportaren. Men nu är det ändå lite ironiskt att ett band som etablerades så här... med sexy och vågad New Wave-svärta ändå för evigt kommer bli förknippade med en låt som mer svämmar över i gullig Romeo och Julia romantik. Yeah, Magnus, you actually taught me something I think here. You described it as part of Terry and I think you just hit on something that probably made, probably the key as to why that song was so successful. And if you think about it a second, Terry got to be herself. Because she is a Juliet. She wants a Romeo. And and that song is that sort of feeling. And when she's saying it, I think that's why people connect, because she's, she's crying out like a Juliet. She made that song come alive because it's so honest to her. Yeah, I never thought about it before, it makes a lot of sense. You had your biggest hit with Take My Breath Away, but the band broke up. Was it worth it? Oh, God, yes. Take My Breath Away is a gift that keeps on giving. Still is opens the world to me. So there's no regret involved in Whatsoever. It is a gift in my life that changed it and still gives to me all the time. <laughs> 